we are uh, a patriarchal society we do not like women in public we do not like women with opinion i wear a sari you know so they will say oh look ye hamara dress pehen ke hame hi gali bakti hai they have identified a few enemies of hindutva like they say that our country will become a world power if this was not for these 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 people we have with us ms arfa khanam who is a senior editor of the wire and is a journalist of repute of 23 years standing arfa we'll be talking about many many issues but to begin with 23 years huge following and fair amount of abuse and hate as well that you receive how do you deal with it well i think i just don't you know um over the last 9 years i thought maybe i had developed a thick skin for all the online abuse that comes my way but the more i think that i've become resilient and i can take it more maybe the online threat has now shifted to offline so swiftly in the last 2 years the trust me tista i really do not worry or care about online trolling at all because what the powers be what they want to do right now is file a case on me and send me to jail so this is how real the threat is it is literally on my skin for someone like me with a public face and profile it is becoming increasingly difficult to even do regular journalistic work like reporting for that matter uh last year in 2022 when i was reporting on uttar pradesh elections uh i literally had to kind of uh, run uh, away and literally had to go out from a village where i was interviewing a bjp mla and his uh, followers started shouting religious slogans and also nationalistic slogans to intimidate me and my team so this is what the life is right now um uh, to give you another example i really wanted to go to ayodhya to see what was happening around uh, especially this was one single moment i feel in the last several decades that has really impacted so many people in one go and as a political journalist covering hindu nationalism covering bjp and rss for me to not go there because i did not feel i was safe enough challenges for a muslim woman a video journalist senior producer anchor who's very strong views and assertions and her faith and identity also make her the most vulnerable that is at the end of the day what you're saying uh, and it doesn't speak very well for an india which wants to become you know the uh, uh, booming uh, economy etc when you have this kind of threat faced by one of india's prominent women journalists mental health security your family yeah so first of all i think let's accept it that we are uh, a patriarchal society we do not like women in public we do not like women with opinion and incidentally my work is such that i deal with opinion i deal in opinions i am in the opinion market as as a person who reports who writes who appears on camera and who also comments on politics of the day so they do not like any criticism of the government they do not like the kind of cultural uh, you know um, nationalism that we see day in and day out on social media that's reason number 2 reason number 3 is of course my religious identity in just one attack they take away all of that they try to take away all of that credibility from me that when i speak people see only a muslim speaking they don't see an indian speaking a journalist speaking a journalist reporting so um i feel that whenever they want to attack me before my work they attack my religious identity and also another funny thing <laughs> i've observed this that another thing they don't like is that i of course i have an arabic name and a muslim name and i I'm a Muslim uh, uh you know I was born with a Muslim identity but I don't look like a Muslim mm. and this is something they particularly don't like because they can't put me in a box I wear a sari you know so they will say oh look ye hamara dress pehen ke hame hi gali bakti hai apart from say the Muslim identity which is directly and first under threat under this majoritarian regime undoubtedly which are the other identities do you think that are being stigmatized with this majoritarianism I think anything everything that comes in the way of this whole fascist identity so they have identified a few enemies of hindutva like they say that our country will become a world power if this was not for these 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 people so number one will of course be the muslims then there will be christians then there are leftists then there are communists then there is amu then there is jnu 
And surprisingly, even the main political opposition, political party, Indian National Congress, Rahul Gandhi, all of these people are also made to look like enemies of India. Even for that matter, Sikhs or Jains for that matter, when you saw this whole farmers protest, um, you know, many Sikhs were really shocked to see the kind of hate and otherization and how they were called traitors because until then they were made to feel like part of this, you know, wider, bigger um, Hindutva family. And all of a sudden, you see this, this, you know, wave of hate, the storm of hate for the Sikh community uh, because the farmers who were protesting against Modi government's three farm laws, uh, the, this protest was led by Sikh farmers. So, you know, their, their religious identity was attacked. So, you know, they are not really loyal to anybody. All of them, I mean, everything around this whole thing is just a strategy for them. So anybody and everybody who comes in the way for them uh, of building this whole majoritarian state, Hindutva state, is an enemy today. Arfa, we're looking at an emergent independent media in the face of all these challenges. That's one of the wonderful things we've seen in the last 10 to 15 years, is that whether it is digital portals, whether it is a few channels, whether it is some of the uh, social media, YouTube channels, YouTube channels particularly, you have this emergent uh, independent media, which I think is now becoming the more, more credible voice. What are the challenges for this independent media, given the fact that we are such a diverse country, number one, with so many languages, and, uh, uh, and of course the fact that you have this huge corporatization and money power on the other side? Well, I'm so glad that you did not call this media alternate media, but you called us independent media because I have huge objection to being called alternate. I am not alternate. Independent media is not alternate. And most of this independent media is emerging uh, in the digital space. I have always said, and I want to say it again in your show, that, you know, look, um, the mainstream, inverted commas, in, uh, in quote unquote, this whole mainstream media, it excludes majority of the population, the population which needs the voice, which needs to really speak out, and make themselves heard and seen. So, you know, most of the Muslims, Christians, farmers, laborers, youth even are women. So 15% or even less than pop less than that population occupies all of 100% of the screen space and uh, entire newspaper pages. So I'm so glad that one of the byproducts of this whole kind of assault on the media was the emergence of the independent media. Um, so I feel the challenges are multifold. Uh, one challenge is uh, of resources, uh, which of course I would say is the biggest challenge. Second challenge is also of the reach, which again is some way connected to resources. And the third and the biggest challenge right now in 2024 is the survival. Whether we will live to see another day, the kind of broadcast laws and IT rules regulations you know, it, it's all coming so close and it's so close home that sometimes it just feels surreal, you know, whether uh, me and you, the way we are talking to each other, whether tomorrow people will be able to see us or not, whether we will have a voice at all or not, whether the government will, whenever they would want, they can just delete any of my videos, you know, they can delete entire channels like they've done in in, in the matter of Kashmiri um, uh, journalists, like they really blocked an entire news website. You know, they have destroyed an entire news organization called News Click. So the way the assault on media is so serious that I feel more than reach and resources now is the question of survival, of existence. I'm really keeping my fingers crossed and, I, crossed and I really hope because this is not just about me or my career or my existence. I feel with people like me, with my organizations like me and with people like you, uh, you know, we give voice to so many I would say millions of the marginalized people who've, who've always been voiceless. And I thought for the first time, and you'll be surprised that my organization, the, the Wire and the YouTube that we run, it's now one of the largest in, in India. And I used to, I was under the impression that we, that internet was a privileged medium, right? Internet and YouTube was a privileged medium that only educated people with internet connection would be able to see us. But let me tell you this to you, that there are people in small towns and even villages watch The Wire and my programs more than the people 
who live in urban spaces. So, you know, this is about everybody. This is about all of these people who've been traditionally, uh, politically, socially, economically marginalized for the last 75 years, not just now. It's just that now they have been further pushed to the top. What mainland India is going through with a very oppressive regime, majoritarian regime, proto-fascist regime, uh, 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 Jammu and Kashmir and many states in the Northeast have gone through that kind of repression in different forms even before that. Uh, and of course, it's much worse now. The example you gave of the Kashmir website. Uh, uh, how does uh, independent media, with all the challenges of resources it faces, ensure voices from these, these lands, these areas of our country, which are even otherwise more uh, marginalized than others? It's like even Chhattisgarh and the Bastar region. I would use in the same area because you are it's it's a very militarized zone, very difficult to travel there. So I think that also is included in my question that how does independent media access reportage and news from there? That's a very important question and a difficult one. How do we do it despite you know uh, limited resources? Because there is only this much resources which you can. And in the last 10 years, the politics has been such that Mr. Modi keeps us just so busy in the mainland just covering one thing after the other you know you you are not done with covering one thing and the next is there and the whole news cycle is is so busy that it's just so difficult to even think about what's happening you know in in states like manipur or for that matter kashmir but that's the that's the real thing that when the challenge is so grave and this is when we really should like i'll tell you last year uh, around this time i was in kashmir and uh, it's unbelievable that when I went to downtown and just took simple uh, testimonies, bites from people, like putting mic in front of them and letting them speak. Would you believe that? Report, I remember watching. Yeah, that report became so sensational on internet and even, even not just in India, even in the whole South Asia region, because even this little bit of you know basic reportage is not coming from you know, that region. But to give you another example, so when I was trying to interview journalists and try to know the state of the free press in Kashmir, this is exactly last year, um, the, out of 35 people, only four young journalists in perhaps their first years of the profession, they appeared on my show. So there is something which is so telling in, in just this story that I told you, that how the state of affairs is, and you do not even have a press club in, in uh, Srinagar anymore. Uh, so the whole area is so militarized and I can't really say that we are really giving them enough voice, enough representation. So what happens is that at the end of the day, what you get is only government's version of the events. That, okay, all is well, Kashmiris are dancing on 26th January, on 15th August, uh, you know, all kinds of stories that finally now Kashmir uh, is assimilated into the mainland. And some of the, the the star Kashmiris who used to represent young generation, who used to uh, you know represent uh, Kashmiri aspirations, they've also switched off over to the other side. I don't know the reasons behind, but it's really unfortunate that in those couple of people, uh, you know, uh, perhaps some uh, Kashmiri view used to get to the mainland, and we we could hear from them. But now even that is gone. So the entire political leadership, if you see right now, uh, is so. Um, is is it's just so difficult to to know what's happening in Kashmir? Thank you so much, Arfa, for spending your time and uh, doing what you do. Thank you very very much, and thanks to the Thank wire too. It was an absolute honor to be interviewed by someone who I've always looked up to. Not just me; you've inspired an entire generation of women like me. Thank you very much for your work, Tista, and Thank for you having. So